it's uh, lovely to be here. Um, I'll be talking about uh, joint work with uh, Ellen Sly from Berkeley. A and actually, um, I gave a talk about four years ago about something related, about, uh, about, this, uh, the, about the easing model in 2D at the critical point. This is going to be uh, a study that is motivated by 3D. So there are various things that, that, uh, that are by now understood very well in two dimensions, but our goal is really to try to elevate the, the, our understanding. And in some cases, uh, uh, things that physicists will, will tell you that they are convinced in, but we'll try to find, we, we are still struggling with, uh, with rigorous proofs for uh, in three dimensions. Um, and, and since this is a mixed audience, um, I'll be, uh, I'll be I'll be taking it very slowly, and uh, I will uh, maybe uh, at the end of the day uh, we can ask uh, Doron how much he uh, <laughs> how much he recovered. But 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 the the idea is uh, I'll, this won't be a very technical talk. There are some there are a lot of calculations behind, kind of lurking in the background. I'll try to just give you uh, the conceptual ideas that separate this, uh, this is a, a pair of uh, a fairly recent work that separate them from the previous ones. And just feel free to pause and uh, to stop me and ask questions as we go along. Okay, um, so um, <coughs> towards election day uh, tomorrow, I thought to start with a, with a very friendly slide that will seem completely unrelated. Or it may seem completely un unrelated, at least to those who are not experts. So let's suppose that we have uh, a bunch of, it, this is actually, it's, it's referred to as the one dimensional noisy voter on a cycle with a given parameter of noise, but this is a technical term. What we have is N guys standing on a cycle and each of them has a binary vote. It's either uh, red or blue or either zero or one. And there's a dynamics associated with this system. It's very simple. At every step, a guy wakes up here I wrote it, uh, to be completely friendly, this is discrete time. We, we wake a random guy, a uniformly chosen guy, and this guy updates its vote, his or her vote. Uh, the new vote is going to be either a copy of a random uniformly chosen neighbor, to the left or to the right, or, so this happens with probability, let's say, a 0.99, or with probability 0 0.01, well, epsilon can be anything. Uh, you just toss a fair coin, and that's your new vote. Okay, so either mimic or fair coin toss. So this is the model. <laughs> and you run it until it equilibrates. So uh, the, the question is, how long does it take this thing to reach equilibrium? And what we'll be interested, actually, is to be able to answer questions that are much more refined, such as, for instance, <coughs> Is it faster for this model to equilibrate if you start with everyone having the same, uh, well, let's say if, if, if this, the left half and the right half are, um, are kind of uh, the same, or let's say if it's alternating, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, or, uh, or 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. Can you compare these two? <coughs> oh, okay. Um, the, uh, well, this, this sequence is longer, but yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I meant to write here 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, for instance. Or, <coughs> ah, okay, so that, that's a very uh, good question. Uh, we'll get to it later on, okay? But, but you can see that, okay, okay. There is no? Why is there no? Of course there is. This thing, Okay, this is a, this is a theorem. What? Sta there is a stationary distribution for this process. It's a distribution. Okay, so notice that even if you start with everyone red, I, di I didn't mean to spend so, so long on this. This is just a, a motivation. But even if you start with everything red, there is a tiny chance that someone, some epsilon, or think of epsilon, take it to be a half if you want, that someone will t change into blue. And then this will propagate. And what you will end up with is something that isn't IID, it isn't a product measure because there are correlations between neighbors. It is something that looks like a, a mixture between, it looks like kind of like um, a, a, def, a, 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 product spe, a product measure with defects. It's not really independent, but uh, correlations die exponentially fast. 
this what? Why don't you hold on to these questions? We'll see. This is just a toy model. And the, the point in this slide is just to say that we're interested in asking questions uh, in relating the equilibration time of a process, even if it's fairly simple, to its initial state. And you, it doesn't have to be a deterministic state. You can ask whether it's faster if I started from a fair coin toss everywhere. Or, from all mo or, or what can you say about a typical uh, starting state? So if you, you take a half-half everywhere, but now you condition on it. This is the same so for almost every starting state. You can ask questions like this. And until very recently, we could, not, we could not answer them even in this, even for this specific example, <coughs> which is just, as I said, a toy model in one dimension. OK. So the easing model. So the easing model uh, is actually going to be very related to this, to this example. But, um, and I'll keep drawing it in two dimensions, even though the real thing that we're interested in is the three-dimensional one. So what is the easing model? It is just uh, a set of, it's a, it's a probability distribution over votes, over opinions. This time, instead of uh, organizing them on a cycle, we organize them on a, on a grid, a square grid like this. And the only thing that I need to tell you is the, what, what weight you assign to, a, to, a, to one configuration. And this is just proportional. This is a, a normalizer. It's proportional to this thing. You run over the bonds. And if there's a, an agreement, like here or like here, you count a 1. If there's a disagreement, you count a minus 1. OK? So this is the sum over the bonds of 1 if it agrees, minus 1 if it didn't, times an external parameter beta. Uh, so beta tells you how much, how much the system is going to punish you. It's going to be positive, like 0.1 or 0.2 or 0.3 or 10. And it's going to tell you how much the system is going to penalize you for every disagreement. Okay? So if you take beta to be 0, then this is nothing, and you get the uniform distribution. Okay? If you get beta to be infinity, then, uh, th uh, this, then at zero temperature, you're not allowing uh, disagreement. OK, so beta is the inverse temperature. This is called the partition function. This is the model. It's very simple. So, um, okay, so this is what I just said. And uh, one way to measure the, the amount of uh, order or disorder that you have in the system is just to take the average spin. Okay, so I just sum over, uh, over the sites and count a 1 or a minus 1. And, and, and this tells you whether you have a bias towards plus or minus. Now, this is a, a trivial observation. If I uh, look at the expected value of this thing, this is the average spin, then it's 0, identically 0. Just because I can take any configuration and inverse every vote. So I get exactly the same contribution. Remember that this is, a, this is the weight. So by symmetry, if you have more pluses, then the same weight goes to the exact same configuration with more minuses, and the expectation is 0. And one way to break the symmetry is to just say that we'll put pluses on the outside and freeze them. So this uh, will be the conditional measure, given that there's pluses outside. Or we can just think of it as if it's, uh, it, it is equivalent to just saying that we have easing inside, but these guys have always a frozen, frozen neighbors that are plus. And then you give the, 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 the normalizer will just be different. It's, the same, it's just saying the same thing. So now this trick with, uh, with changing every plus to a minus no longer works. And, and the question is whether what you have as you let the system size go to infinity, you're just keeping the square of pluses of the bound. This is what we'll call the boundary condition. You're keeping it fixed. And now you're letting it run to infinity. And, you're, and the question is how the bulk behaves, given that it, it used to feel the, the pressure of the pluses, but now they ran off to infinity. So is it that in the bulk, you remember that there is this very distant square of blue pluses? Or is it the case that maybe guys that are very close to the boundary feel the pluses, but as, as you grow farther and farther away, the, 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 there is decay of correlations? And it this just looks like dynamic. This, is just this is just, yeah, this is the static, there is yeah, there is no dynamics. The That's right. Uh, excellent question because uh, we're going to have to slide exactly about this in like uh, very quickly. So it depends only on beta. And there should be a phase transition between these two p 
pictures, and this is the, the famous uniqueness threshold of the easing model. Okay? And so there should be a critical <coughs> beta C. I mean, there should be. There is. All of these things are, uh, okay, and we, and we have experts in the audience uh, who have uh, uh, contributed to our understanding of these things in the, in the 70s, and, and um, we'll get to that uh, very soon. So if there is this critical point beta C such that if beta is less than beta C, then it does look like this. So, so formally, if you look at the expected magnetization and you start with this all plus boundary but let it run to infinity, it will go to zero. It's not zero, but it will go to zero. And if beta is strictly bigger than beta C, then it will be strictly positive. Okay? Positive because we put a, everything is a monotone, we put a plus. Okay, and this is called the spontaneous magnetization. Okay, so this is the, the phase transition of easing. I didn't say what happens if beta equals beta, z, beta critical. Um, actually, yeah, it is kind of a, a funny. At beta equals a beta critical, the magnetization should also be zero, it's similar to, uh, to the fact in percolation. Uh, in three dimensions, so the, and this amounts to saying essentially whether you have a decay of correlations or not. And so you look at two spins. Okay, I, these these things are look, uh, are called spins. And you look at, uh, at at the measure on the entire uh, in the entire Z2, and you're asking whether their their correlation decays with the distance. So at criticality <coughs> in uh, three dimensions, this was proved about just just a little over maybe a year ago. Half a year ago? When did you upload the paper? Uh, less than a year ago. It was, it was short. It's, okay, so, so uh, four dimensions and higher, it was known also by Michael and, 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 and who else? Uh, the, the, who, uh, you had a co-author on that paper. I forget. Uh, uh, about three and a half dimensions. About three and a half dimensions. Okay. And, uh, and, and this paper was with, was with a, this in three dimensions was just last year with uh, Vlada Sidorovicius and Hugo Dominique Copin. So, um, so as I said, the, the understanding three dimensions is really, um, is really challenging, and, uh, and this is what's going to motivate us further on. But going back to Avi's question now, um, this was just the static measure. Okay? There was a behavior when beta less than beta critical, you think that this thing should go to zero, and, should, and this should also cover beta critical, and now, and, and now we know that it does. So. Uh, so uh, also in three dimensions, so, so this little thing invades to, to the critical point. Above beta critical, there is a spontaneous magnetization. Now the dynamical picture should exhibit a phase transition as well, exactly at the same location. Okay? And, the, and the phase transition should be the follow, as follows. Um, you're going to discuss a natural dynamics that updates single sites, okay? where a site, a site wakes up, and updates its vote, just like in the toy example. But it updates in, its vote instead <coughs> of uh, with some probability it's a half-half and with some probability it's a function of its neighbors, which is, uh, instead of doing that, it's going to, uh, to update its vote in the right way, so that, well, the right function of its neighbors, such that what you'll get in the end is the right easing measure, because we don't want, the, to, have a, we don't want to convert to the wrong thing. So you'll, you'll do a single side dynamics like that. And then the single side dynamics, will, you'll ask how long it takes it to equilibrate. And this thing will move from log in the, let's say, the, the surface area or the side like that. Log is log of, of anything. So let's say it's an n by n box. So it will be log n here. It will be n to some power here. And it should be e to the n here. In three dimensions, this will be e to the n squared. But OK, so it's the surface area of the box instead of the of the side length, but that, that's a detail. And this power law here at criticality is expected to be universal. So you can run it on, on a square lattice or a triangular lattice. It will always be the same, the same uh, exponent, regardless of the local geometry. It's, uh, it's the fact, it's the, dim the dimension matters, but not the, but not the lattice. Uh, this, is, uh, this is for the mixing time. If you're asking about the spectral gap, was that going to be your question? I'm just trying to make sure that logs make sense faster mixing. Yeah, yeah. faster, okay. faster, <laughs> yeah. Exponential, <laughs> exponentially slow, okay. exponentially slow. And this exponentially slow is because you have, you can, 
you have this picture, but you have the other one for the minuses, and so you have a double well. You don't know which one you're going to, to go to. You're going to go to one, and then it's going to take you exponential time. You're going to start in it to actually discover the other one. Uh, so this is this situation, and that's why I wrote free boundary condition without these pluses around you. Okay, so if you don't have these pluses around you, then this should be exponential because you don't know to which one you're, uh, you, you're headed. So, okay, oh, oh, you get sucked into one and then you're missing the other. Um, if you're asking about the, the, the spectral gap, then it would be a similar picture, only here you will say fixed, constant, like an expander. Here you would say power law, here you would say exponential. So, uh, 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 the reason that I emphasized uh, mixing time as opposed to the gap, because then you can actually ask mixing time starting from where, as opposed to a gap, which is just a function of the matrix. Uh, ah, okay, nice question. Uh, the short answer is that uh, we really, we, the, we know what's going, wh what happens, but we cannot confirm it even in two dimensions. What happens if we put the, if it, in this regime, if we put an all plus boundary? Okay, then what should happen is that it should be n squared. <coughs> okay, and there's a very precise uh, conjecture, it's Fisher and Hughes goes, to, uh, goes back to 87, that if you start even with all minuses, but you have this square around you that is plus at low temperature, the minus, it looks like a, a droplet, like a bubble, and the boundary squeezes it until it vanishes. And it, it, the, the way that it squeezes it is exactly according to the curvature. It's mean, called mean curvature, motion by mean curvature. So you just write the integral of something called Lifshitz law, and you see that it should be n squared. And I have, I really have a, maybe if we have time, I'll show you a, I have a movie for how it, how it happens in three dimensions. It's super quick, but right now uh, our, our bounds are, uh, are way off. In two dimensions, there's a paper uh, with uh, Martin, so with, uh, that we showed with Martinelli, Toninelli, and Sly. That's the best known bound. It's like n to the log n, quasi polynomial. In three dimensions, the best known that bound also should be n squared. In three dimensions, the best known bound is e to the n. The, the n squared for any dimension? The n, no, the, it's n to the d minus 1 in, in any dimension. So even e to the n in three dimensions, actually, you need to work for it. You get, you get e to the n square for free, and then you need to work to shave off an extra n, but actually the truth is way off. Okay, but these are advanced questions. So, uh, yeah, global dynamics. What is this uh, dynamics that, that we mentioned? Um, so what we do is the following. Uh, a site wakes up, as we said, and it wants to update uh, its value such that the limit, the, the, the stationary distribution, would be the right one. So the way to do it is just to appeal to, to this natural rule. You just update to the stationary distribution given that everything else is the same, is, is what you see. That's it. And this guarantees that you will be reversible with respect to the limiting measure. Uh, let's see what it means. Uh, so a plus, so this guy wakes up and it needs to decide between being a plus and being a minus. Everything else is the same. Okay, condition that everything uh, on the fact that everything else is the same. How do we actually calculate this probability? So remember that what we had is something like 1 over z, a normalizer that, let's say, in three dimensions, right now there is very little understanding of. Uh, we, and, and we don't want to calculate it by just running over the 2 to the n states where n is the volume. So, but, but notice that if we, if we just want to compare these two situations, since everything else stays the same, the only, the only difference between the weight of this state and the weight of that state is the immediate interactions of this guy with its neighbors. Okay, so here we have two pluses and four minuses, so you can just say, okay, if, if it's a plus, then, I, then there's a, a constant factor that I, don't, that I cannot calculate, but it's constant. It depends on the normalizer and on all the other interactions in the system. And here, if it's a minus, then I have you know, four agreements and two disagreements. So I can calculate the ratio between the two. And given the ratio, I know what the probability is to put a plus and what the probability is to put a minus. So simulating the easing model using this recipe is a, an exercise that, that you can give an undergrad to do and generate nice pictures. It's very simple. And, and arguably, this is a, a natural way to model the dynamics, the evolution of the dynamics. 
So a guy wakes up and just decides according to its local interactions on how to set uh, its, uh, his or her, uh, uh, how to set the new value, and then you just progress with this. And the question is how long it takes it to uh, get to equilibrium. Now, in order to ask this question, I, I need to tell you how I measure distance from equilibrium, and this is going to be the usual uh, total variation uh, distance, which is L1, essentially. So a total variation distance is just uh, your worst distinguishing statistic between the two measures, okay? The, 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 set, the set A that emphasizes the most the difference between these two measures. And, this is, and, and in L1, it's just you sum over the, for instance, your points in the space and, and, and take the, the absolute value of the difference between them, and there's a factor of two for a finite the system. So it's a half the L1, formally, but never mind. It is essentially the L1. And we're looking at the first time such that this thing drops below epsilon. It is monotone. It is decreasing. You can use a, a coupling to show that it's, al that it's always going to, to be a monotone decreasing. But, uh, and then at some point, it's going to go below epsilon. This is your mixing time. But from, the worst, uh, from, the, worst from the worst starting state here. But you could also uh, phrase it for a given starting state, as we will need to later on. And it will be the same. But instead of maximize over x naught, it will be for 1 x naught or for a distribution over x naught. Now, epsilon is, is an arbitrary uh, parameter here. Usually, people take 1 fourth or 1 over e. It's convenient for applications of, multi of a, a getting it to be some, getting the, uh, some nice submultiplicative uh, properties, but it is still arbitrary. And the, va the kind of the dependence of this thing is in epsilon is, is what we are interested in when we are discussing the cutoff phenomenon. Cutoff very uh, roughly says that epsilon doesn't matter. That's it. <coughs> yeah, it means that if you take any two fixed values of uh, epsilon and epsilon prime, the leading order asymptotics of the mixing time is going to be independent of them. Okay? So, uh, so of course, this only makes sense when you have, so what does this mean? This means that, that the ratio goes to one in the limit. The limit of what? You have a system, an underlying system size, and as that size, so for instance, a graph, and as the number of vertices goes to infinity, this th these things are, uh, are asymptotically the same. In our case, it will be the, the size of, of, the, of the system, of, of, of the grid on which we run the easy model. Okay, so, so these are the two possible pictures. In one of them, uh, Mixing to point 0.9 and mixing to point comes, comes first, then maybe mixing to point 0.8, point 0.7, point 0.6. They all have the same order. In the other one, point 0.9, point 0.8, point 0.7 all occur as the second order term, the second order correction in the, in the asymptotics of the mixing time. So all the action happens here. You are one minus little of, of one di distance away from equilibrium here, and you're a distance little o of one beyond that point. So that's what we mean by cutoff. Okay? Okay, so uh, going back to this uh, picture for, uh, for ZD, uh, this is what we believe is going to happen. If beta is less than beta critical, you should have cutoff. And when, when I say we, I mean this goes back to a, a conjecture by uh, Perez in 2004. There is a, a very good reason to uh, to, to uh, believe that there's going to be a cutoff here, and that's, it has to do with the fact that, uh, that the gap here is bounded. So on a, essentially, in, in every nice system, he has a, like a collection of, of, of situations where, where he says, okay, here the fact that the, the, there's a bounded spectral gap should tell you that there is cutoff, but uh, verifying it is, is uh, open in, in many situations. So here there should be cutoff, time log n, n to the z, here it's n to the specific, e to the specific concept times n to the d minus one. And uh, we are still far from, uh, okay, specifically this point. Um, so what I mentioned before on the magnetization at criticality for uh, z3 is like the, the first prerequisite that you need in order to say that, uh, that you have a polynomial uh, bound here. For the, mixing, for the mixing time. You need, uh, you need, you need a much finer understanding of uh, still on the, on, the, on the way that correlations decay. So it's, it's good that now we, uh, we know that they decay. Before that, we didn't even know that they, they <laughs> actually, after we, after we had this, uh, yeah, I remember that it was very, very surprising. We were working on the two-dimensional case, and we, it, 
we had no idea that just showing that they decay in three dimensions was still open. And for per per percolation, it's still open, by the way. These are wonderful problems. Um, OK, so here we have uh, Eisenman and Hawley in 1984. Um, so you actually know that uh, in two dimensions, the entire, so ev the entire picture is confirmed. If beta is less than beta critical, uh, you know the T mixes log n. In this, so uh, Eisenman and Holly actually showed you, uh, will tell you that uh, that at beta critical you can you always have you can you will not have a log n mixing. So at least the lower bound that it is at least a that is that it is not logarithmic, it is at least polynomial is known. This is the upper bound that's missing. So uh, at low temperatures it's like this. At critical temperature. Uh, at the critical temperature with, with uh, Allen, we, we gave a, an upper bound. Um, Holly also, also we improved the, the lower bound a little bit. Uh, they, uh, but, but actually, I, maybe, maybe the bound by, uh, in, in these papers by, uh, by Eisenhower and Holly was about n, and we improved it to n to the 1.75. But it is really, uh, it is the, the lower bound is it's not the right one, and it's not difficult. The upper bound is, is, the, is the, the hard bit here. Uh, and we have no chance of getting to the right value. The, the, the right value was the co computer to be this. We get something. We don't even write what the constant is. If we really had to, we get something. We would get something no better than ten, I think. Okay. And this, and we use these uh, Wusserstrom or Welsh estimates machinery by Smirnov and his uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, okay. We, so, and that is what I talked about last time. Today, I want to discuss this bit. And this is the picture from, from a paper that we had a couple of years ago with Alan, where we showed that in two dimensions, you do have cutoff. So the system kind of, uh, the, you run the, the dynamics, and it's uh, at distance one from, uh, from equilibrium, and then all of a sudden, it drops. So you see, there's no epsilon here. The epsilon goes into the log log n, into the constant before the log log n term. So if you plug in this mixing time a fourth or a tenth, the leading order asymptotic is the same. This lambda infinity is the spectral gap in infinite volume. It is some physical quantity. Um, so uh, okay, this paper was uh, had 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 several uh, new new ideas. It took us a long time to uh, to complete, and the proof is is, is quite complicated. And if you look at the, at the method and try to elevate it and see what it gives in, in other situations, in other dimensions, in a, you'll see that there are two kind of very, uh, uh, I don't know, there are, there, are, there are two limitations that are quite uh, uh, strong. One of, th one of them is that you don't really work, the, I mean, we get all the way to beta critical, but yes? Uh, if they, if they, in, excellent question. Uh, if the, if the variables are, are completely independent, then w what is the process? It means a guy wakes up, and we just write a zero one value there, or a plus minus value there, because the stationary distribution is just a product of uniforms. Okay, because there's no interaction, there's no interaction with your neighbor. So a guy wakes up and writes a zero one or, or plus minus uh, value, and he goes back to sleep. Okay, so this is equivalent to just a uh, taking a random walk on a hypercube. You start, let's say, without loss of generality, they all start at plus. And now he, a guy wakes up and writes a plus minus, guy wakes up, writes a plus minus, and the mixing time would be the time it takes the system, you don't see the board, but the time it takes the system to kind of uh, equilibrate. So, but because of symmetry, you just want the number of uh, pluses to decay to about square root of the volume, because these are the normal fluctuations of the binomial distribution. Okay? And and this was actually the first example, well, one of the first independent examples of cutoff shown by Aldous in 1983. So this does happen exactly with the gap. And, and this is order one, actually, instead of log log n. Because what you need, you want, you want the fluctuations to be root n. So you want every guy to have the right probability. So this will be half log n. There's no lam lambda is one. Because uh, in, a product, in a product of independence, each of them has gap one, and they are in the product space, so it tensorizes, so the gap is one. So you'll get the time that it takes one of them to, that it takes you to get to root n fluctuations, e to the minus this, to the minus a half log n, will give you this uh, root n, <coughs> one over root n. 
and, and will now be the volume, uh, the, the number of sites. So, and, and then if you want to, to get this mixing time to be less or more, you will tweak an additive term, plus 10 or plus 20 or minus 20. So the window, there is this, con this uh, I don't know, this paradigm that says there is no log log n in nature, right? <laughs> so this should really be an order one. And we knew that this is going to be, I mean, it was obvious this is the other one. The fact that we got this log log was because we used the, these log Sobolev inequalities. We had like boxes and we wanted each one to mix. And the boxes were small. <coughs> and we want to say, actually, this will look as if they are independent. So let's put distant boxes. They will look like they're independent. Each will be size log. And uh, the time that it takes us to equilibrate one of them, we need to equilibrate uh, them in L2. This is getting uh, too, uh, too detailed. But, but, then, but then log of the time that of the size of the box of size log is log log. Anyway, so, so this, is, this, is, this came from, uh, from our method that just relied on log Sobolev inequalities. Uh, and there was no getting around it. That is the second caveat. The first caveat is that in order to just propel it initially, we wanted a condition that was not this bet beta less than beta critical. Beta critical is called the, the uniqueness threshold because, uh, and one way, a very informal way of saying it was thinking that in the limit you could, I know, uh, okay, in the, in the system you have like these two phases, like mostly plus and mostly minus. Okay, so there are two equal kind of limiting measures if you take a box and let it to infinity because it needs to decide whether it's going to be mostly plus or mostly minus. This is very informal, but but, uh, but it kind of captures the idea behind why, why this, is a, this is called the uniqueness threshold. Okay, so uh, you're trying to find the uniqueness of a, a, a unique limiting measure for this. Uh, and, uh, and we don't have this condition here. Instead, we want something that's called strong spatial mixing, which kind of says it's, it has mixing in its name. I didn't give the name, it, uh, but uh, okay, in other places it's called strong regular uh, analyticity. Maybe it's a better name. It has nothing to do with dynamics, this term. It kind of says something about decays of correlations. It says that if you have a box and you change values at the boundary, then the, then the effect on a marginal somewhere away from the changes it decays exponentially. It's a strong condition. Uh, and, but, but the reason that our proof worked all the way here is because um, uh, Martinelli and Olivieri, there, there were several works that verified the strong condition all the way to the critical point. Okay, so, um, okay, so here we have a, we have the state of the art, and now I'm going to, to discuss, ah, okay, here I, I had this in the slide, beta equals zero, independent spins. Um, it was refined in, yes, that's right, okay. <laughs> Uh, C and the C is actually a half. C log n with C equals a half at this location. And this is one reason to suspect that it's going to carry all the way. There's a, a, another paradigm here that kind of says that, in, that for this dynamics, if you're at beta critical and then you subtract beta by a little bit, then it's a, qualitatively it's as if beta equals zero. Okay, so this entire regime should behave as if beta equals zero with some defects. Okay, it's, it's an imprecise way of saying it, but, uh, but uh, we do expect cutoff for a every beta less than beta critical, it was conjectured by Yuval, with an order wi one window, it should be exactly as if they were independent. Uh, instead, what do we know? In three dimensions, this condition, the strong spatial mixing, is no longer known to hold all the way to the critical point. It fails. Uh, okay, it's not known that it fails. In some situations, you can tweak like external fields. There are situations where, where it's expected to fail and was even shown to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other, the, the other one will, uh, will uh, yeah, will, uh, the epsilon will come here, will come in the other one. It will be a function of epsilon and beta. Um, and actually, the constant will also depend on beta. Because you, will, you, you no longer have like a, a gap of one. You will have like something that is a, so the constant will change. It, this lambda infinity from uh, the previous slide had beta in it. It was the spectral gap of the infinite system with that beta. So that also depends. Okay, so here's a concrete question that we didn't know until a few months ago. Um, take 3D easing <coughs> and take beta, which is 0.99 beta critical. Do you have cutoff where, when? 
y. Okay, so that's, uh, that's one thing that we didn't know. Just understand 3D easing close to beta critical. Okay, that's question number one. Question number two goes back to this toy example. Um, I have another idiom for you. Random start is better than ordered start. This is the picture that we were after, right? This is what we were trying to converge to. Why should we want to start the simulation from an all plus state? I mean, we want, it's like, uh, in the case of IID, of, of beta equals zero, what happens if we start it from a random IID state? We are already mixed, okay? That's a good start. So then the mixing time is just zero or one. <laughs> um, and in general, you could say, okay, so maybe I have some correlations that I don't understand, but should I start from IID plus minus? And you see this in, in the literature. I took this off of a book. Uh, you, see, you see this in, uh, it's called random start or hot start, warm start. The, it has various names in, uh, in the physics literature. And the question is, it, here's a concrete question. It's formalized mathematically. What does it mean to start from a random start? It means that we are aver our measure at time t is the average of the measures from over all the starting configurations. That's what it means to put an IID spin at every point. Okay, it's a, so in physics uh, jargon, this is called annealed. I have, I, have the, I'm, I, I have one randomness from the process and one randomness from the initial state, and I'm looking at the, at, at, at the, single, at the, the average distribution together. And I'm asking, is this faster? Again, there's a mixing time. There's the first point where it drops below epsilon. This is faster. So, uh, guesses. Yes, no, no. Okay, I have one no. <laughs> okay, the, so, so the yes should be by how much? Yes, okay, by how much? By how much? How much, how, how much faster? So it is the faster. How much faster? Okay, let's try to save the one half line. One half. Uh, I'll be as ambitious. Oh, by log n? Low. So everything. Oh, okay. The, 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 it change the con change the constant by how much? I'm gonna go with yeah, half, half, half. Okay. 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 We'll see in two slides. Third question. And that's the last one that we are interested in. And this is the last idiom. No more uh, selling. Uh, universality. Okay. Of cutoff. That means that. We have this result on the 2D, this result on the 3D, but there are these meta results. Okay, again, Michael and uh, okay, <coughs> the Bush and Schlossmann. These, the, the, the use of, a, of, a, of, of uh, coupling techniques goes, goes back to Holly and the Bush in the very early 70s. And, and, and it shows you that on any graph that you run the, the dynamics, if beta is less than a constant over the max degree, then you mix in time log n. Okay, you can get it from, a, from path coupling, it's a, it's a, but it's a classical result. And, and that means that you can expect the following. If beta is less than a constant over the max degree, you should have cutoff with an order one window on any graph. Okay, so this is, uh, I don't know, maybe people say universality these days for almost anything. <laughs> uh, but there should not be a dependence on, on, uh, okay, on, on, on any of the things that we used in the lattice, which I, I, I neglected to say. Our proof, if it is an expander, we, we later had a paper that kind of pushed this lattice proof to arbitrary graphs, as long as the growth of balls was sub-exponential. But you do assume some symmetry or vertex Nothing, or nothing, okay. nothing. I'll, I'll need to assume symmetry or transitivity if you want me to write a, an expression for where cutoff occurs in terms of the gap. But, 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 but other than that, there is a natural guess which says you have different guys. Different guys will look differently. Each has its magnetization, like, like the probability that it's just this guy's plus if you start the system from all plus with time. Once the first moment drops to square root of the number of vertices, so you have root n fluctuations, that's when this cutoff should occur, exactly then. So this is a guess. And uh, okay, this was our guess. It is okay. 
the real one is actually, it's very close. It's closely related to that. Instead of the first moment, you should look at the second moment of the exact same quantity, and that tells you the truth. So uh, like, uh, anyway, um, so I was saying that on a lattice, uh, if you try to extend our, our results, they would break exactly when it's an expander. And this is not really a coincidence, because you can think that what we have here is kind of like guys that are updating and updating and updating, and everything should happen in time log n. So if it's a lousy expander, if it's not an expander, then you can kind of anal get a chance to analyze the dynamics before the updates get a chance to reach all the sites. Otherwise, you kind of say, OK, I mean, I'm doing an update. And before I, even, before I get to my designated target time, maybe the updates affected everything, and I lost control. So expanders are really a pain. But a pain for, the analysis. for the analysis. For the analysis. And so we didn't know the following trivial uh, ex kind of a, it looks like a toy problem. Take a binary tree, and beta can be 1 over a million. What happens? Do you have cutoff or not? We didn't, we didn't know that. Uh, uh, yeah, anything. It doesn't. Uh, so uh, uh, there's no. Okay. I, I, I meant to say that it, that it's like it's so small. It's smaller than any of the physical uh, uh, conditions that you need in order to get, you know, strong spatial. Get whatever you want. And still, but it's positive. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. So I think that uh, the, the traditional way that we answered problems, like this was the paper on the lattice and the paper that we mentioned on beta critical, and this is the thing that I answered at first on, uh, on like this quasi-polynomial. If you look at these papers, they look like they, they all come from the same warehouse. There's a, this, <laughs> there are like two sections. One of them will have dynamics in it some multi-scale analysis, recursion, block dynamics, sensoring. These are all various tools that allow you to analyze various types of induction on the dynamics. And then there will be a separate section, usually, which has something that has no dynamics in it at all. This will be an equilibrium estimate on the static measure that the dynamical analysis will use as a black box. In this paper on the critical, uh, on the critical behavior, we had kind of like a certain inductive argument. And our black box was taken verbatim from uh, Dominique Copan, Nolin, and uh, Clement Hongler, these uh, students of Smirnov. We just had, they had exactly the right estimate that we needed to fit in our uh, framework. So we have these two parts. You analyze the dynamics, and then you call something about the equilibrium estimate. Here we needed something about the interfaces converting to, conver uh, converging to Brownian bridges. And here we needed the log Sobolev estimates. Okay? So you have this separation. And the problem is that when you have the separation, you have these two, two boxes. In, you lose in the interface between them. Because, for instance, I don't know if it's a, So the, the problem is you want to say that something to track the process. And then you want to say, okay, various things should work in my way, it, it, it should work out well with, with good probability. But since you're using this black box, you, you keep taking the worst case. You don't know whether the worst case of this box matches the worst case of that box, if you see what I'm saying. I'm trying to say that the, the right way to do this is study both of these together as one process in the space-time space. -time space. You are supposed, OK, yeah. So this is actually an analysis. It it's a three-dimensional picture, but it's an, an analysis of 2D easing. And the top is like the configuration that we want to understand. And what we want to understand is how updates move from vertex to vertex in space and in time. And this way, there's no need to kind of call a black box on the equilibrium measure uh, separately. You don't lose. So this goes back. Uh, this idea for, for, uh, for other processes, for the contact process, was, uh, goes back to Harris. It's called Harris's graphical representation. Uh, what we have here is a, is a specific tweak on it. Um, we haven't seen it for the global dynamics anywhere. Uh, and, and, and it goes like this. So the idea is very simple. Let's see if I can get, this, uh, get, uh, get, uh, get you to agree with me that it is really simple. So we want to understand an update from a vertex. 
eventually. Yeah. But first, I want to show you a recipe for calculating the state at time t. That's it. How do you calculate the state at time t? Well, it is very simple. First of all, I will just give you a list, a list, and that list will look like uh, here's vertex that I want to update. This is the time of the update, okay, time. And here's a unit variable, unit variable. So every time a vertex wakes up at this time, and this is its randomness. This is the randomness that you need for the coin flip. You look at your neighbors, and then you need to make a decision. Okay? This is a real number in zero, between zero and one. This is an increasing sequence of times. Each ver and, and, the, and the vertices are random. So this is just a way to encode the dynamics. Vertex, time, unit variable, and so on. Okay? How do I generate time in? I look at the first time that they form a given starting state. I look at the minimal t, okay? I, I, I look at that vertex, and I update it according to its neighbors and the unit variables, and I continue, okay? Now let's do the opposite. Instead of just starting from zero, I want to start at time t at the end. I have this list at my disposal. So I look at, at the last time that this vertex was, so latest most time that this vertex was updated, okay? And now I can see from the unit variable that no matter, I don't know the value of, my, okay, let's, uh, put it, let's do it like this. I'll update this vertex by recursion. So I need to look at my neighbors and make up a decision. So I'll apply recursion and calculate their values using the list and then make the decision. So far we didn't save anything. The saving comes from noticing, it's a very simple uh, observation, that since beta is positive, even if all my neighbors are, are plus, I still have a positive probability of being minus. Like e to the minus, the number, time, uh, the number of the neighbors, okay, uh, times beta, right? It's still positive. So with this probability, I will just say that I'll draw a, a, a uniform zero plus or minus value. Okay, so I have a share of the unit variable here that I'll, uh, that I'll call, this is a share theta, in which I'll say half is plus and half is minus, and the rest depends on the neighbors. The rest depends on the neighbors in the right way so that we can get the right marginal at the end. Okay? What does this mean? It means that as a guy kind of I track it, then there is a chance that I will not even want to look at my neighbors and calculate them. And this way, I mean, one way is to just to branch and recurse to the other neighbor, and the other is just to kill this branch immediately. So we get this picture here where you see kind of like guys either splitting to their four neighbors or dying at once. Okay, so you get something that looks like a branching process. And what happens if all the guys, this is, this is all a simplification, of course. What happens if everyone dies? Okay, so I'm taking beta to be very small. It is one over a million. And at some point, they, so it, you just look at the mean of a branching process. It's, it branches to four guys, let's say, or, or you kill it. Beta is very small. It's going to die out. Eventually, all of them are going to die out eventually. What happens if they all die out before they reach time zero? Then it means that they do not see what the starting configuration is. But then you could have started from the stationary distribution just the same. So you are mixed, completely mixed. Okay? So the point in, in understanding this is, is, is to say that actually we want not to wait until everybody dies out. We want to wait until about root n of them reach the bottom. And then even if you started from all plus, you will get a surplus that is kind of within the normal fluctuations. But you can then not only look at how many guys reach the bottom, but look at where they hit the bottom. And then you can analyze specific starting configurations. And say, for instance, if it's the box is half plus and half minus, then maybe 
or, or maybe if it's alternating like a checkerboard, then when I reach the bottom, by the time I reach the bottom, I'm fairly mixed, and it's as if I put an IID spin there. Or you can do various things. So this is where the initial configuration kicks in. OK. Uh, so uh, the, I'll just say one thing that we actually, this is like a simplification. We don't really kill the guy with some probability or let it branch to all the neighbors. In some of the applications, we'll do something that is like doing a Fourier analysis. Sometimes look at a one random neighbor, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes four, according to the right way in order to get the right bounds. And in the 3D case, which is the hardest, we don't even know what the rule is. It's not Markovian, but we know that there is a way to do it. And sometimes a guy will update, and it will affect, and we'll have to kill another guy that is far from it because the measure is complicated. We'll just know that there is a way to do it such that the process will kind of be subcritical. OK, that was a, an advanced um, statement. Let me just give a, some results and then show you how the initial example kicked in, uh, why it's related. So OK, in, in any, in any, for any d, but we care mostly about d equals 3, you have cutoff around the point where you have root n fluctuations for the magnetization, exactly what you want, with an order one window. Exactly as if beta equals zero. So we got rid of this log log n. Actually, it's even log of one over epsilon. It's as if you are doing a random walk on an expander, right? You want to get within distance epsilon. Takes you uh, log of one over epsilon. Here are some examples. Um, OK, so you have cutoff. Um, so this is, this is our, our main result, and, 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 and the, the proof is uh, substantial. But uh, so the proof uh, dies over, I mean, it's probably worth for other graphs with the sub exponential bond growth, but not for. Oh, we'll say that. We'll, I, have, I have something about that. OK, so here we reach, uh, we, we just use, in, uh, so we just need weak special mixing, a not strong one. Warm and, and cold start. It turns out that if you do start with a uniform, you get a factor of two improvement, yes. <laughs> so it's a factor of two better. Okay, so this is roughly what, what uh, so roughly, I mean, we prove some things, accurate things in one dimension, but uh, less accurate things in higher dimensions, just because we said the paper, we want it to be less than 40 pages, no matter what. So, uh, but, but this is more to demonstrate the method. The method can, can do all of these different things. Um, so, so this is a little more surprising. I think we were surprised. If you take a uniform initial state, it's twice faster compared to all plus. But if you take a uniform one and condition on it, so this is the same as saying from almost every starting state, it is as bad as all plus. OK, so here's, here's an example for the cycle. OK, for the cycle, worst case is this, from all plus up to an additive order one. Uniform is a half that if you start from a uniform, from uniform IID spins. However, for almost every X naught, the only improvement compared to this is an additive log log n factor. So asymptotically, they are the same. This is a little, uh, there is a way to, uh, uh, to explain it, but it's like uh, one way to see that for the, for the hypercube, the fully independent case, if, if I draw a uniform state, I'm already mixed. Because every guy is IID, then you're mixed. If I condition on it, so for almost, every, so f then it's as if without loss of generality, it's all plus. Just because, so then you're back to the. So at least you see that on the, with this beta equal zero case, it trend, it, it it tells you why there's a difference between the two. But still, in the, it's a, I don't know. We we didn't we expected some improvement. Okay, and for universality, we showed that. Uh, for any graph with, the, with bounded degree, if beta is less than an absolute constant divided by d, you get cut off with an order one window. It can be a tree, it can be an expander, it can be anything. The, the, it's the second one, not the first one, as I mentioned. Don't, <coughs> don't pay attention to it. Only for, but okay, this kappa is maybe a tenth in our proof. It should be one, but, but the dependence is the right one. The one is, you cannot do better than one, yes. And, and to get to this, our first proof got, we said, ah, OK, this works. And maybe it's a, but let's see how bad it is. It was like e to the minus d squared, I think, our first proof. And then we had to do this Fourier in order to push it to the right point. OK. <laughs> uh, OK, so I want to finish. Uh, I, I won't get a chance to say much, 
but I want to say the to, to say two two uh Yeah, yeah. The, if you use that, that's, in, that's enough to get e to the minus d squared. Yeah, you need something more complicated to get. OK, uh, I, I want to say uh, one thing conceptual and one thing that just so that you will see something uh, about the, the, these uh, processes and related to this voting problem. The, the conceptual thing is that uh, I think what we do here is you have these clusters and it is important to kind of say that there are three types. You track the updates from a point, and, the, and, this, and whenever a, a, another guy also tracked his update from a point, these are lines in a graph that lives in time and space. And we look at the connected components. Now, if a guy looks like this, it goes down, and then it branches out. These guys branch out. They intersect, branch out, intersect. They eventually, they all die out. But it didn't touch any other guy at the top. So the connected component of this guy is just this singleton. What does it mean? By symmetry, the values here, can, I mean, everything can just, there's no dependence on the initial state. So everything is symmetric. So this guy at the top is a plus minus fair coin toss. OK? This is very nice. We like these guys. OK? It doesn't matter how complicated this cluster is. You can always invert every, everything. This is a more dangerous guy. It reached the bottom. And the bottom may be all plus. So it gives you some kind of a, an effect of the, of the initial condition. So this is, these are guys that actually make it to the bottom <coughs> are, are going to be delicate to treat. But we'll choose our time t such that, by definition, the, fair, the expected number of these is, let's say, uh, root n. OK? Lastly, these guys. These are guys that don't make it to the bottom, but actually connect so various guys at the top connect one to another. This is where the correlations of the Ising model are shown, because no matter what you put here, you have these guys, and they are positively correlated. OK? I think that the, one of the conceptual things that we did here was to say, this is where the Ising measure is. This is what you want to, to, to analyze. We are not going to analyze it, because we do not understand it in three dimensions up to the criticality. Up to criticality. We will condition on it. OK, you condition on it, and you kind of hold your breath and, ex and, and kind of hope that this conditioning will not be too, too hard. Conditioning means that the rest of the space, when you are exploring these components, is not allowed to touch these guys, which is a pain. This the clusters are conditioned not to touch those. But what do you get? You get that there's a fight between the reds and the, reds and the blues. On what, on, 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 on what remains. And then you can kind of uh, say that the effect of the reds reaching the bottom is negligible compared to the fact of the blues. And, and that conditioning on the green, what you have here is essentially a measure of a, a product measure of, of, of blues, of IIDs, a pro just a product measure of independent coin tosses with a little dirt. What's the relative function of uh, you know, fixed everything? Fixed. This is fixed. And, and, and this is fixed, and this is rare. Green. OK, so what you want to say is that Ising, of course, is not a, 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 a product measure. It's the, the spins are not IID. You want to say that once you condition on this, it's not even close to it. But once you condition on these, it is asymptotically a, a, a product measure. And, and product measures, you have tools to say that, that something is essentially a product measure. So that, that's the point. And now I want to finish with this thing, which is the example from of this uh, noisy voter I mean, towards election day tomorrow. What is the one-dimensional easing model? Let us track it. I want to track my update. Now I go, I go down in, backwards in time, and I want to say, OK, I get updated. Here's my unit, my unit variable. So what are my options? Either my two neighbors are the same, in which case it really doesn't matter which one of them I'm going to choose. I'm going to, I mean, look at one of them. Or they disagree. But since there are exactly two of them, if they disagree and you need to make an opinion, you might as well choose one of them at random. OK? So when you are tracking this thing, your opinion, you either, at, with some probability, you just write an in the, you don't look at them at all. You just write an IID value 0 or 1. This is this x killing. 
or you do need to look at them, but then there's no more splitting. You just can go either right or left. This has to do with the fact that in higher dimensions in ZD, there is a better rule than just saying branch or kill. Here you see it immediately. The better rule is to just go right or left. So what do we get? We get just continuous time random walks. Okay, they go right or left on the cycle that merge, and there is a killing probability. This is the entire model. Okay? And if you calculate, I mean, the probability of, 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 of not needing to look at your neighbors is very easy to calculate in this case. And then you say, I want the, 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 the first moment of, of a guy here to actually make it to the bottom. So the probability is just e to the minus t times this, this rate. I mean, you kill it with, with rate theta. So, with, so if we choose this time, then there will be root n left when you reach the bottom. Okay? And this is the, the one-dimensional easing model. So you can see the dependencies so in, in, in the model. Where, where, where do we see them? In the green guys. The green guys are where neighboring sites are, uh, are correlated. And this is why you see, Doron, you can kind of see what the measure is for this voting problem. It is the same problem, exactly the same problem. Like the translation between epsilon and beta, like e to the minus, it's, it's this one, essentially. Um, and, and so you can see that these guys are correlated, but, they de but the correlations decay exponentially. And uh, there are guys that actually depend on the starting state. And this will change the, the, the answer, whether you start from all plus or whether you start. So, we, so the answer to this original question is that if each of, of the voters, let's say, is plus or minus with half, half probability, it will mix twice faster than if they are all plus. But for almost every starting state, it will be asymptotically the same. And if you start with 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, you can actually show that, OK, you can show various things. But this would be essentially the best starting state. And 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1 would be slightly worse by, by, by the leading order constant will decay. And then essentially, as the block goes to infinity, the constant will decay all the way to the, to the all plus 1. So you can say things like this. Um, OK, I think that this is uh, about all that, uh, that I wanted. I want, if, if someone is interested, there's a very cute kind of three-line lemma by Miller and Perez that allows you to say kind of that, that, that if you have reds, like, like just it's, a measure, it's, a, it's something completely general about two measures that are supposed to be close to uniform. And the, the point, I think, for us is to just bound not just the red clusters reaching the bottom condition on these horrible greens, but we need to take two random instances and look at an exponential moment of the number of guys that are red. This, this turns out to be the, something like this. You see exponential moment of two to the intersection between two reds. If you show that that thing decays, then, uh, then, then you can get a bound on the L2 distance, which is what we, we need here. This is, um, this is how we actually let let the blues and the reds fight one another after we conditioned on the greens. We want to show that the reds cannot do too much damage. Even if you pay an exponential moment in the reds, and, and since they have this exponential tail, then, then this should be controllable. So this is, this is where the work uh, is invested. OK, so I'm, I'm done. These are open problems. Um, I will just focus on, on these. Forget, there's all the other models. We don't use monotonicity. We don't use a lot of, uh, OK, we, we don't use any tools that are specific to monotone systems. So this can finally maybe push us to the critical point in POTS in this method. There's no censoring or anything, or any of the other tools that, are, uh, that, that use mon uh, monotonicity as a prerequisite. But in 3D, um, I mean, we still need to show even you know, just that there is no cutoff at criticality. We don't know that. Um, and to show a power law, so building on this, uh, on this recent work by, uh, by Michael and uh, Vladas and Hugo, and getting anything better than this horrible e to the n closer to n squared if you put plus <laughs> boundary conditions. So these are, <laughs> these are que questions where we are still uh, far off from uh, the best known bounded criticality is still exponential. OK, that's it. Thank you.
Okay, this the top left the top Yeah, okay. I'm trying to say something uh, so I started from this dashed line here. This is time zero. Okay? Forget I mean in this picture we have something going backwards in time. That's a, a different matter, but we start at time zero and we care about the distribution at a fixed time t, which is the top. So I'm just telling you, you want to address just this top circle and show that it is close to the stationary distribution. Okay, that is what you want to show. And in this, actually, as long as we have this picture here, uh, if you want to know what the stationary distribution is, actually, the stationary distribution is what happened if you did exactly the same thing, but there was no time zero. You just continued to minus infinity. You didn't do anything special here. There's no starting configuration. You just waited until everyone dies out. Because if everyone dies out, then you can couple it with the stationary distribution. And then, so you can say, OK, if I want to specifically compare this distribution to the stationary one, which is what we need to do when we discuss specific states, because you can no longer do worst case sandwiching of all plus and all minus like you do in these systems, you really need to compare one specific distribution to stationarity. Then you can just say, I care just about the top. I know what the stationary is. The stationary measure, also in higher dimension, is what happens if I run this thing to time minus infinity. And the only thing that I need to understand is how the defect at time zero affects what's happening uh, at the top. So here, instead, we are running from time, uh, time minus infinity, but at time zero, we suddenly say, ah, I'm going to, instead of just carrying these branches, I'm going to override them with the, my fixed initial state. And then you want to kind of see how, what effect that has at the top. So that's how we can, uh, uh, by the way, this uh, thing that I, I should say, that saying that at minus, in running to until everyone dies out or at times minus infinity, you get the stationary me me uh, measure is exactly, it's called coupling from the past. It's in disguise exactly the same thing. It goes to Pop and Wilson. It is, uh, it is a beautiful idea. And, uh, and here you can just see it visually. That that if you want to, that if you want to, uh, to, to simulate uh, your distribution exactly, not approximately by a Markov chain, you can, in a sense, roll backwards time. I mean, instead of running forward, you run backward until everyone dies out, and then you get exactly the stationary measure and not an approximation of it, in a nutshell. Here? Oh, okay. So, uh, so. Uh, this, is, this picture tries to tell you why there's a factor of two. This is an answer to uh, why, why, why half, half, half every point at, uh, everywhere is twice faster than all plus. And the point is, before you kind of said, well, root n guys reach the, the bottom, and then it means that they are, uh, the, the bottom was all plus. This gave me a surplus of root n pluses, which is as much as I can afford. Now, the bottom is I idea half a half. What, what does it mean when it's I idea half a half? A point makes it to the bottom, so I write it on I, I idea half a half. So what? If it carried on further down and then died, then I would write this I idea half half. So really, making it to the bottom, I don't care about it anymore. It's a good thing. The, the thing that I don't like is when two guys make it to the bottom and then, and then they merge, for instance, because then in this situation, I would put the same value in the stationary measure for both. But in my situation, I put an IID value for, for each of them. So I'm, less I'm not correlated. And so this is the obstacle. The obstacle is two guys making it to the bottom and then, co and then coalescing below time zero. But they have to be close enough to coalesce after that. Otherwise, they just die out if they are far enough. So it's essentially asking for to double. You want a guy to really be close to you and also hit the bottom. So it's the, essentially the square of the probability of hitting the bottom. So instead of, of, uh, of so, so, so you kind of gain a factor of two. The bad event get, happens with square the probability, right? So, uh, so, so the mixing time is, uh, is one half. Okay, anyway. So uh, you redefine what blue is in, in order, uh, what red are. You need, yeah, 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 you could consider that. Uh, 
uh, yeah, well, the, yeah, you can, I guess, <laughs> I guess it depends on what you want to say. You want to just <coughs> say that, it, if you just want to say that if all the interactions are, are if, if they are uniformly at most something, at most a constant divided by the max degree, then certainly you are fine. Uh, if you want to say more complex, because then, uh, I mean, you see wh wh how the proof works. You want to say that you have these clusters and you want to kind of control when they die out and what the intersection between typical ones uh, is. And, and so if you had just a bound on, on beta and you took the worst one, everything would work. If you want something finer, I don't know. Yeah, that is the, the voter model. Yeah, which is exactly the voter model. Yeah, so I think that, okay, so, so I, can, I can say that uh, our method, uh, so we, we, need, we need some, some probability, some epsilon, so let's say that we are looking at this noisy voter model that has been studied. Uh, so we want some small probability of killing, of killing the walk, uh, just so that you will be able to say. Uh, and, so, um, and so instead of just in one dimension, you could apply it in higher dimensions. And I think that everything would work. So you could say, for instance, that if you are running the, the voter model with this small probability epsilon of a defect, I mean, there will be a critical value of epsilon such that, and, and up to exactly the right point, you should be able to just say, everything should be much simpler. Because one, the, the thing that really, uh, that, that is a real pain is the fact that actually guys split and then merge and split and, and merge and you have these kind of sausages around traje trajectories. What you want to say is that a guy that survives is just one guy, a a lone strand making it all the way to the bottom. And this is really what's happening, but, but from up close, he kind of, there are these decorating clouds around it. It's like uh, sausages, and then they die, and then they inflate and die. And so if you are in the question that you proposed, uh, there, are no, there are no such uh, clouds. There really is, the picture really is like this one. And then the analysis should be much simpler and you should be able to address specific starting states and uh, what the best one, worst one. Here, oh, well, this is a hyperbole. Uh, I just, uh, you, I wanted to demonstrate <laughs> uh, just on different geometries that you can, uh, but you can, you can do, so the, the base, one rule, one rule is to branch out to all of them. But, but another rule is just to say, I have a function. It's a deterministic function of, 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 of the number of guys that I see in, uh, in pluses and the number of guys that I see in minus. It's one dimension. I can do the discrete Fourier analysis of this, of this function and say, and put some weight on taking a singleton, some weight of taking a pair, some, and then according to these weights, I'll just take a random singleton and look at it and do something. Or with another portion of the probability, I'll take a random pair, look at whether it's plus, and do something. So, and that's what we actually do for, for a general graph. For 2D, okay, for 3D in, in general, we don't do either. We just <coughs> say the properties of the model, the weak spatial mixing, the fact that, there's, that you're below uniqueness, tells you that here, if you look at, there is a way to choose kind of like the rule such that you will, you will kind of uh, be subcritical. And actually, okay, this, the, uh, I can tell you offline, actually that doesn't work either. We kind of need to reserve some randomness aside, do everything, and then re-inject the randomness from the unit variables to kind of boost. There, are, there is work. In, in 3D, it, it is much harder. But, uh, but eventually, like this Harris graphical representation of things, it does carry you to the right point. You just, and, and you can get much better precision. You can understand where you started from. So which graphs, uh, if you look at the irregular graphs, which ones are the worst in terms of cutoff? Oh, uh, you know that for a random uh, deregular one, 
it is known, this picture of the phase transition is known. There's a Mosel and Sly show, the, show that there's like a fast, uh, fast and exponential. It's not even known that it's polynomial at the critical point. And we don't know that there's cutoff. Ah, small beta. Uh, yeah, actually, this is, here's a, okay, this is a adva very advanced question, but let me answer uh, you uh, like this. Uh, think of just a lone guy that survives. The red guy, think of it as if he's just, he never sees anyone else. He's just a single guy. So he's walking in the graph. The thing is that if the expander is good, now, now you look at the starting state, Maybe some, maybe, maybe I don't know, some uh, plus minus, some plus minus, some something that looks fairly balanced. If the expander is good, then there is a fight between killing the guy, which may be good for you, but then and then you put an ID spin, or maybe letting it mix well in the graph. So the mixing, the the, the gap on the expander, there there is a fight between that and and the killing rate, and and. Yeah, so depending on the expander, you can get some weird things. So for instance, you can get things where you increase, you, you increase beta, so you kind of cool down the system, and actually the mixing time becomes better. It should be that if you cool down the system, the mixing time is, is always increasing, right? But, but <laughs> okay, but, but here you kind of, you walk well and you mix, and it's not worthwhile to kill, so you want a lower probability of killing and a better probability of moving. That's okay. So we still, but this is just preliminary. We didn't write anything down. All right. All right. <laughs> and I'm reminding everybody that we start today at 2 o'clock our series of five lectures.